This is American Real, where we aim to inspire, empower, and enlighten you through the stories of our guests. Here's your host, Roger Brooks. What gave you this spark to become an entrepreneur at such a young age? For the first probably 18 years of my life, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I got a job at a law firm and then I decided I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. Um, but I knew that I always wanted to own my own business. So what really shifted my frame of thinking was a, the first entrepreneurship teacher that I had in college. She had us do a challenge where we wrote down all the problems that we faced for a week. Then task number two was to think of solutions to all these problems. And that was literally a pivotal moment for my brain because I started to see that I started to see the world differently did in my day-to-day -day life. So instead of just seeing problems everywhere, I literally saw opportunities to solve them. Let me guess, you're an entrepreneur looking for ways to grow your business online. And you've probably tried everything to grow your business, including social media, SEO, even paid ads, only to find out that nothing truly works. So what if I told you that writing a book that goes on to become a bestseller is the magic wand, and that you can do it in as little as 30 days, two weeks, or even over a weekend in some cases, without spending more than 10 minutes a day? Would you be interested? My name is Roger Brooks, and I'm the founder and host of American Real TV, where I interview world-class guests to empower others through the essence of story. But I didn't get here overnight, and my mission certainly doesn't end here. Ever since I was a little boy, it's been my dream to empower others through the craft of writing and storytelling. And throughout my life, I came across several mentors who pushed me toward my passion for writing books and helping others to do the same. There is no greater joy than to be working with aspiring authors and to help them establish true credibility within their industry by writing and publishing their first book, which I'm proud to say have all gone on to become bestsellers. Now, you're seeing this video because I just opened enrollment for my new book writing program, where I promise to take you from page one to published in 90 days or less. I will be personally working with you to overcome the same fears and obstacles that kept me from pursuing my dreams all of those years. Simply click on the link below to see how I could help you become a first-time best-selling author. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Alexis Schomer. You are a serial entrepreneur, digital marketing expert, author, and speaker with a passion for solving problems through innovation. Born and raised in Los Angeles, you graduated from California Lutheran University, Thousand Oaks, where you co-founded your first tech startup. Alexis, welcome to the show. Hey, Roger. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you. And I'm so excited to talk to you today because uh, as we talked in our first conversation, you're one of those young, inspiring people that I found on LinkedIn, and I thought it was really important. Most of the people, and you know, just in fairness, um, most of the people I interview are, are middle-aged, I would say, you know, 40s, 50s, and you know, they've already made it, so to speak, or they're on their second career. What's fun about today's conversation is that you started while you were in college, and I had an opportunity to read the chapter in your book that I received and, and I'm so inspired. So oh, thank you. I want to inspire others through your story. So let's do that today. Um, but take us back. I'd, I'd love for you to take us back even early days. Like when you were growing up, what was the household like where, where you grew up in? What gave you this spark to become an entrepreneur at such a young age? Well, I actually wouldn't credit it to the household environment or my parents or even my personality because in the early days I wanted to be a lawyer and 
for the first probably 18 years of my life, I wanted to be a lawyer. So I got a job at a law firm and then I decided I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> Um, but I knew that I always wanted to own my own business. I didn't know what it would be. And I didn't switch my frame of thinking to think like an entrepreneur until I took entrepreneurship 101 in college. So I, I personally feel there's a difference between being a business owner and being an entrepreneur. And you can be both, but a lot of business owners aren't um, innovative and they don't, you know, like owning, for example, my family owns a dry cleaner. So my grandpa's a business owner but I wouldn't necessarily classify him as an entrepreneur because he didn't start something that didn't exist or create some new technology. So the, the, what really shifted my frame of thinking was a, the first entrepreneurship teacher that I had in college. She had us do a challenge where we wrote down all the problems that we faced for a week. So we wrote it down either on a notebook or in our phones. And I listed things such as, trouble finding parking, um, trouble reading parking signs, uh, trouble carrying a phone when I go out, things like that. Things that are annoying me or things that I just couldn't solve. And then task number two was to think of solutions to all these problems. And that was literally a pivotal moment for my brain because I started to see that. I started to see the world differently in my day-to-day -day life. So instead of just seeing problems everywhere, I literally saw opportunities to solve them. Um, step three in that challenge is to pick your favorite one or the most viable one and roll with it. So that is really, that's what being an entrepreneur to me is really about. It's about thinking of ways to solve problems. And if you encounter a problem, most likely somebody else encounters the same problem. And if you're willing to pay for a solution, then maybe you have a good business idea. So it was that moment where I started to think like an entrepreneur and think innovatively that shifted my, my career path and I've never gone back. That's a great story. And I'm curious, do you keep in touch with this teacher? Yeah, yeah. She, uh, I, invite her, I invite her whenever we have pitch days. And she asks me to come back to her class every semester and pitch, and pitch to the students and share my experience. And it actually has inspired other students who are taking the class as um, just to get some credits. Um, there's a, one story specifically of a student named Chad. He started a company called Recruit You. And he said that because he saw me and my experience in that class, it made him start his own business. And now he's doing it full time. So super, super exciting that we have that opportunity and that the teacher brings back people from, the, from her past classes to share. And when I was in the class, she brought other people that were in her class and started their own business as well. So it's, it's more relatable when you can hear students share their story from the same class that you're in now. That's awesome. And would you mind sharing her name so we could give her a, a shout out? Yeah. Absolutely. Her name is Renee Rock, and she teaches at California Lutheran University. Renee Rock. Wow. <laughs> Sounds like she rocks. <laughs> That's a great story, Alexis. So let's talk about your startup story. How, uh, you know, take us through. So you go through this class, you're starting to get, you know, your mind shifting a little bit. You're, I'm sure you're becoming motivated about this new word, uh, entrepreneur, that you've wow. come across. Uh, what happens from there? So I joined the entrepreneurship club at my university and um, we had the opportunity to participate in a local startup weekend that was being hosted for the first time by Ventura County. So it was um, hosted by the county and they had a $10,000 cash prize for the winner. And it was in the fee they wanted it specifically to be in either healthcare or agriculture verticals. So a few of us from the club were like, let's do it. You know, let's give up our weekend 54 hours to this competition. Um, we ditched the parties, we ditched the homework, and we just went all in. So we went to this competition. We all pitched ideas. Um, my original idea was an at-home STD tracker. And these are ideas that you just think of on the spot, like 30-second pitch. So there were about probably 50 ideas that were pitched. And then you vote on your top, on your top three favorite ideas. And then you form teams around them. And then you have your team to develop your business. So Unfortunately, our team was the only team of young students and none of the doctors um, and ER directors and nurses and whoever was there wanted to be on our team. So we were actually left out and we formed our own team with the four students that went from, from my school. And uh, we, the original idea that we came around was some sort of concussion detection helmet. Um, quickly realized that it already exists in the market. So then we had to completely scratch it and start from, scrap, start from square one. And then I had an idea, um, well, I was, we were trying to think about like, what experience do we have in healthcare? And we didn't really have much healthcare experience. So 
my only kind of connection to healthcare would have been through sports and athletics. And I used to be a competitive cheerleader in high school. So I thought of an idea for a device that a cheerleader would wear around her wrist so that when she's holding a girl in the air, um, if the girl, if the girl leans forward and her wrist is bending, it would beat or it would, you know, shake or something. It would give a, a signal like stop, stop uh, towing, we call it. So my team went with this idea because we didn't have anything else. And we were like, all right, we're going to do joint, joint activity tracking. So let's, let's shift from the wrist to the largest joint in the body, which is the knee. And then we decided to shift from cheerleading to powerlifting because um, I was thinking about powerlifters and how they're judged in a competition when they have to hit that 90 degree squat. And it's, it's by eyesight. And I'm like, there's so much level of, or there's so much room for human error there. So we should have a device that tracks it. So we did this um, pretty much for at least 24 hours. We got data. We, we went to gyms and interviewed people. Um, we, we developed like a prototype. And we were going to create this wearable for fit for squat tracking, essentially. One of the original names that we thought of was Squat Sense. And then we, we decided to go with the name Rep Watch because we're watching your reps. But then we realized that not only is... Um, not only does that exist in the industry already, but they don't need it because the industry has been doing just fine without it. So we'd be creating a, a wearable and a, this app for a reason that people probably wouldn't pay for because the, the judges are doing fine tracking by eyesight. So it was literally two hours before we're about to pitch. Um, and one of the judges kind of discredited our idea and we were like, all right, let's just go home because he, he brought up a competitor that we hadn't found. And he's like, this already exists guys. So we were super bummed out. We were just considering um, leaving and do, catching up on homework for the weekend. And then a mentor came around and asked what our idea is. And we didn't even want to share it because at this point we were just so bummed out that we put all this time and energy into this great idea that we had just to get discredited. So finally he got us to share the idea and he was like, Oh, that would be great. in um, physical therapy, especially for workers comp. And it was just like a light bulb. And we're like, you know what? Let's pivot. Let's do it. So two hours before we walk on the stage and pitch, we changed the whole deck. We changed the whole business model. And then our final solution was the same idea of tracking and counting reps, but for workers that were injured and trying to return to work. So we, we tried to sell this to the workers' comp insurance companies. Um, they, they loved it because we could actually catch the cheaters and eliminate fraud. And we pitched this, and we won the $10,000. So... <laughs> That that's was great. Yeah, that's that, my story. What did that judge have to say? Um, he was impressed that we pivoted so quickly, and we actually kept in touch with him, and we actually won a free um, provisional patent from him. He was a provisional patent lawyer attorney, so we kept in touch. He helped us develop our provisional patent for that company, um, and we still still see him around. Uh, that this was a few, uh, like, I think, uh, four years ago now. That's great. So. Yeah. Did that product actually come to market? So we were, we developed, we worked on that product for a year and a half. Um, we were almost complete with the first version of the app. We had a prototype for the wearable. And then um, my, my business partner and I got bought out by our third business partner for that company. So we left before it actually launched and started our second startup together. Okay, great. Wow. Well, congratulations. What a, what an amazing story and uh, what a, you know, the, the fact that you guys didn't go home, that you did the pivot and that you won the contest. Yeah. Just says so much. That says so much. So walk us through your next startup or as you call your startup story. Okay. So phase two, uh, my co-founder, my co-founder, John and I, who are in our new startup together, um, we learned about this shift in the market from in the, I don't want to bore you with the details, but basically it's an insurance shift and it changes the way that providers are getting paid. And we found a niche that is under that currently is lacking a solution to, to kind of go along with the shift because basically doctors now have to manage the budget of a recovery. So we took the technology and all of our learnings from the past startup. Um, we took, everything we learned over the, the one and a half years from that company and applied it to the new company, but with a twist. So now we're specifically helping patients that have had orthopedic surgery, either a hip or knee replacements. We're helping them prepare for and recover from the surgery using similar technology with a wearable. But the difference is that our app is catered towards the elderly um, 
the aging population because knees and hips are usually 65 plus. So we're catered in this specific market and we're working with orthopedic groups and hospitals and surgical centers that perform these surgeries. Incredible. So in, now is this product in market? So we just launched our first clinical pilot um, this last week. So Friday, I think we sent out the, the onboarding information and we're rolling out our first three month pilot. And so this is like the beginning of launching. Um, I wouldn't say it's in the market yet because we're still in beta pilot stage, but we're doing a three month pilot. And then at the end of this pilot is when we'll probably expand, um, take on more pilots and just start to scale and grow. So I have to ask you, is this something you would have ever thought that you would be doing four or five years ago? Five years ago? No, I don't even think I fully knew about this industry, the startup world. So it, I, I, I don't even know. I don't even remember if I knew about the whole tech startup world. So no, I didn't. I thought I would have been volunteering as an English teacher abroad um, <laughs> and, you know, getting a regular job and climbing up the corporate ladder and aiming to be a C-level executive at some point of a, uh, just a, you know, a big company. So I didn't think, I didn't see myself in this position when I was a junior in college, but by the, when I learned about the entrepreneurship world, uh, everything changed. Yeah, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in your book, but I, I, I did read in your book that you advise people. You even said, I wish I started earlier. And mm -hmm. you're saying the earlier, the better, right? Yeah, um, because there's people that start in kindergarten, essentially, where they're selling, you know, selling something. They're buying something from Costco from their mom, and then they're reselling it at school like lollipops. And that it, people have stories where they're like, I was an entrepreneur at five years old. So um, I wasn't an entrepreneur till I was uh, 21, and I had a lot of catch up to do. A lot, all that innovation and like critical thinking and problem solving. If I had started that when I was in high school or earlier, I probably would have been farther along now. So I don't see any reason why you shouldn't start early. Wow, incredible! Um, and it doesn't end there for you. You also have a digital marketing agency. Uh, called Simply Branded. Yeah. I had a chance to take a look at your website. It's a wonderful website. Looks like you have a phenomenal team, um, but you have a lot going on, right? You have this healthcare product solution that you're bringing into market, and you also have Simply Branded. But tell us about Simply Branded. Uh, what is its purpose and mission? So Simply Branded, I'm going to start with the origin story because that's really how Simply Branded began. And it was it's very aligned with my startup life. Um, when, when we first launched our tech company, we didn't have the funds to hire an outside marketing agency. So I took the responsibility of learning website coding, um, you know, social media, advertising, all that, all that sort of stuff. And I just started to do it for our company. And we, we were um, contacted by either community members or people that saw our trade show booths and they asked who did our marketing. Um, and I was like, I did. So they asked for help with their marketing and it was originally started. I just started helping people in the community or um, some people would pay for, for advising. And I'm like, you know what? I could turn this into a business and it just kept naturally growing. And this person would refer their friend or their other um, colleague. And it kind of grew into its own separate business. And what's great about having a startup and an agency side by side is that when you're in, you know, in the trenches in the startup, focusing on the product, not making any money, we have this other source of income supporting us to allow us to have this, um, to continue this lifestyle of the grind in the startup. Because as a pre-revenue startup, you know, we either needed a significant savings from a previous job or we need revenue. And that's how we're able to pay the bills and keep, keep the lights on is the marketing agency. It's so smart. And I, I read somewhere that you've built yourself over a hundred websites which is just incredible. Yeah, everyone needs a website. <laughs> <laughs> but it go and and what I love about that story, Alexis, is that you you found a way to utilize your strengths, your unique abilities. You did it yourself first. You learned the coding. Um, mm -hmm. Then people asked, you know, who's your agency? So the fact that you were able to do that is is really incredible. At, at again, at a young age, I, I mean. Why not at a young age? It could be at any age, which is, which is great. 
Um, but even more so that you were able to, you know, not put all of your attention into the product. That's hard to do, right? Because there's more time, more energy, more focus on other things, less on this. But it sounds like you were able to do that. And then how did you grow the team out from there? Because it looked like you had, you know, a bunch of team members at this point. Yeah. So, to, so I think one of the hardest obstacles has been scaling the agency because you have to weigh bringing someone on and having the ability to pay them. Um, you have to weigh that with trying to get new clients and grow the business. So it's definitely a little bit risky as you grow because if you have a bad month where maybe um, nobody wants a new website, then it's hard to maintain the team. So we scaled slowly over time and we um, scale on a project basis. So I didn't go out and hire a bunch of people and hope I had business. I worked on the business development first and as more clients came in and I built up that monthly recurring revenue, then I expanded the team. So I definitely carried like carried the weight for a long time and, and handled all the tasks by myself, which was very, very overwhelming. But I got the business to a place where I, had consistent clients coming in and then I started to offload some of my work to my teammates. So what I like about my agency is that I don't offer any service that I can't personally do myself. And although now I do have a team that helps me out, I oversee everything. And if I, if a team member got sick, I could fill in the gap. So that's, um, I think that's unique about my agency because most agencies, you know, you talk to the owner or you talk to the salesperson and they don't really know what's going on behind the scenes or they have a technical person handling it. Um, since I came from the trenches, I am that person. So that was, that's a unique thing. And that's how I think what gave us the ability to, to kind of scale in a, in an agile way is that I could be selected with who I want to bring on because I can fill the gaps in the meantime. So smart. And again, great advice for anyone building a business to learn to do it themselves, but it's all relative, right? You say you had to build it slowly. What is slowly? Is it two years? I mean, how really, how long has it been around? Um, well, so Simply Branded itself officially launched um, January of 2018, okay. so just over a year. But I had been doing the work and um, working as a kind of like as an agency probably for the last three years, three to four years. Um, and I was doing freelance work before that. So from the time that we launched Simply Branded, um, we wanted we we wished to grow faster within that first year. So it took, it took over a year to get to where we are now, which we would have liked to do in the first six months. Um, but, you know, I couldn't fully focus on growing Simply Branded because I had a tech startup that I had to work on also. So it, it is like, it is a crazy, it, you know, there's no balance and it's a crazy like push and pull relationship because if we could focus on just one company, it would grow faster. But we need the, you know, we need the agency to be able to keep the lights on and we'd want to do the startup. So it's like, we're just kind of pushing both at the same time. How important is it for you to be a student of your calendar, especially with so much going on? Are you, are you really good about organization and making sure that your time is spent very wisely throughout each day? Absolutely. Time management and prioritizing is one of the most important things in our company. And my co-founder and I spend a lot of time prioritizing together so that we don't work on tasks that aren't the most important because some days I might get caught up in client work when I should have been doing something else that was more important and the client work isn't due for another three days. So we do sit down um, either on a, we try to do it as often as possible. So sometimes we do it daily, sometimes we do it weekly and we definitely do it monthly where we, we say, okay, this is the list of a hundred things we have to do. What's the most important? What's the second most important? And another thing that we do is we estimate the time for each task. So we know that, you know, the first five tasks are going to take an hour each. And then these are going to be 30 minute tasks. This is going to be a five minute task. This is a two minute task. So we have this robust software where we, where we organize all of our tasks, prioritize by um, urgency, due date, and um, estimated time. So definitely something that's important. And we're, we're trying to get even better at time blocking. So, you know, you get calls throughout the day, it takes time out of what you're doing. And what a system that we've tried to put in place is recalendaring the time that was taken away. So for example, I get a client call, takes away 30 minutes of my time that I was supposed to be um, working on this website. I need to recalendar that time somewhere else so that I don't lose it. So what happens is when you get those calls, the whole day gets pushed back. 
And so instead, we want to keep the day on schedule and just reschedule the tasks that we had to miss. So smart. That's so smart. I'm learning a lot today from you. <laughs> Great. And so are our listeners. Now, what about prioritizing? Uh, what if you take on business that is, you know, a lot, right? So this new project comes on, it's, you know, but it's a lot of hours. Um, how do you manage that? Because I know you talked about being really smart about hiring people. Do you try to take on as much as you can first before you take that next step? Especially if a big project just, you know, comes into your lap. What do you do? So I would always uh, manage client expectations before we start the project. So if there's a project that comes in, let's say it's going to be 30 hours of work, I would make sure the due date is far enough away that I can manage it in that time. Uh, and that's definitely happened. We probably one of the biggest projects that fell into our lap was a website. We were building a, a platform from scratch. It was essentially going to be the Netflix of working out. And they gave us 11 days to build it. They're like, we need this by this date. And we looked at each other and we're like, do you want to do it? You want to do it? All right, let's do it. So um, we blocked out time and we made sure that, you know, it didn't conflict with other due dates, but we knocked out that website, that platform in 11 days. And that was the most crunch timeline for that big of a project we ever had. But um, we make it work and we don't take on things that we can't complete. So if they came in and we said, you know what, we're gonna need three weeks to build it, we would just communicate that up front. Okay, fantastic. So let's shift a little bit and uh, talk about what people refer to today as the side hustle. You know, many people have one or more side hustles. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that, talk about your experience with that and, and maybe some advice for people that are looking for that side hustle. Okay, so when I when I was uh, in college, I had a huge um, obsession with the side hustle, and I would meet people and ask, "What's your side hustle?" And I and I always thought it was important to have that. And now that my side hustle has become my main hustle, um, I think it's good also to stay focused. So there is that balance of having too many distractions and too many side hustles, and then staying focused. So I think if you have a full time job then I would recommend having a side hustle because it keeps that creative side going. So you want to have that passion project. You want to be working on something. Otherwise you'll just get lost in the, in the motions and you know, people come home and wait to go to bed to start the next day over and they don't have, you know, something that they're excited for something that they're, you know, looking forward to doing every day. So that's when I think a side hustle is important. Also in college, I think having a side hustle is important because it teaches you more time management, teaches you to utilize resources, all that kind of stuff. So um, there are situations where it's better to maybe to stay focused. Like for example, right now I'm building two businesses. If I had a third side hustle, uh, I think my performance would just go down. So it's, it's about, you know, balancing that out. But when I say side hustle, you know, I mean, maybe someone's really passionate about music and their side hustle is making music. My side hustles were starting other businesses. So I had a pop up clothing line in college that we, um, worked on really hard for three months, popped it up learned a lot, failed, canceled it, but it was really fun, you know, keep that energy going, kept, kept the energy going. And then another side hustle I had was something called a wristband charger. And it was essentially a bracelet. That was a charging cable it came in iPhone or Android. And it was so practical because people often need a charger and don't have one. And so this is something you could wear on your wrist. I actually have one. I'll show you real quick. Um, you know, we figured, found a manufacturer in China, ordered them, and we were planning on, you know, this company blasting out, but it was just a side gig that we didn't give our full attention to, so it didn't go anywhere. But this is the wristband charger. You know, it's worn around the wrist. I'll show you. Very sleek. Comes in five different colors. Cute little uh, awesome. charging cable. And then you just pop it open, and there you go. And then it charges your phone. Wow. So. That's incredible. <laughs> So that, that was an example of a product you found, or did you develop that? I found something similar, and then I, um, I spent about a month researching manufacturers in China who could develop the same thing, and I didn't really care to make it like super original. I just wanted it sleek and low cost, so found a manufacturer, started that conversation. It took about a month of negotiation, and then um, ordered 200 units, and uh, then decided to just focus on my other companies. <laughs> Incredible. All right, Alexis, let's talk about 
the book that you're a part of, Voices of the 21st Century, Bold, Brave, and Brilliant Women Who Make a Difference. I have my copy. I was able to read your chapter. And tell us how this came together. I think it's an amazing, amazing platform. Yeah, so we, all of the authors from that book are part of a group called the Women Speakers Association. And it's a worldwide group of women that are speakers, essentially. And they put it together. Um, it was a really, really fun process. We, if you were interested, you applied to be part of the book. And they chose 50 women. I don't know how many applied, but I'm assuming a lot more. Um, chose 50 women. We submitted our chapters. And then we went through the book launch process together. So we, you know, we had this Facebook group where we would share any ideas, share launch strategies, talk about how to market the book. Um, we promoted the book together and I think my favorite part of that process was the author panel that I put together. Um, I asked any of the, because the authors were from around the world so we got the ones that could make it to LA and put together a panel to talk about the book and that was so fun for me because it was great to meet my fellow authors in person since it was a mainly virtual experience. Um, somebody flew out from Colorado, we had people drive down from uh, oh, hi. And that was so much fun. So the entire process was actually really smooth. It was a collaborative book with 50 authors. And um, the women that had actually published books before said that this process was the smoothest one they've ever been through. So it was a great experience. You know, it wasn't stressful. It was just really fun. And, and I love writing. So it was no problem for me to knock out my chapter. And it's a brilliant business idea, and I'm assuming that each writer gets their name on the cover and that you're able to maybe sell your own books. Do I have that right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. I love it. It's a brilliant uh, business idea. I'd like to read a sentence that caught my attention, and I'd love for you to comment on it. Okay. You say, whether you're just starting out or you're almost at the end of your journey, one piece of advice that everyone can consume is fail and fail fast. I'm sorry, fail often and fail fast. The best learning experiences come from failure. And as an entrepreneur, you cannot be scared of failing. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, in, in the entrepreneurship world, the word fail is not bad. It's good because it means that you tried something and it didn't work. But the biggest part about that is that you learned something. So, you either learned how to do it or how not to do it. And that's definitely part of the journey. And it's, you know, trying things as fast as you can, because in the startup world, if you're not the first to market or you don't make it, someone else will. That's why it's important to get through that process quickly. And the startups that fail long term often took too much time getting through one chunk of the process. So, you know, they say get your product out before it's ready, get users testing it, because if you wait till it's perfect, it'll be too late. Awesome. Great job on that chapter, by the way. It was very inspiring. And I'm actually going to have my kids read it. And oh. we have interns that help us with the program and our uh, agency. And I'm going to have them read it as well. Very Great. inspiring. Thank you. Okay. You have uh, experience with an accelerator program. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So for those of the listeners that don't know, an accelerator is a program that startups apply to, and it's usually three months or six months. They accept um, X amount of companies. It could be two, it could be 10, and you're pushed through this program altogether, and it's meant to accelerate the business. So uh, one example would be um, an accelerator that gives $100,000. It's a six-month program, and they help get you to the next level. So the program that I participated in is called the SAM Precelerator. It's located in Santa Monica, California. And we were actually the only company in our cohort, which was the, very interesting because it was the first time that there was only a single company. Um, but it was a really beneficial experience. And the tremendous value that we got from that was the mentor network. So we had access to over 100 mentors from all different industries. And we met as many of them as we could, set up one-on-one -on -one meetings, show them our pitch deck, ask them specific ind industry questions, and they helped us kind of navigate through the hurdles that we were having to get us to where we are today. So, so grateful to be part of that program. We had our demo day in November, and we just demoed again um, four days ago on Wednesday. So the demo days are when they collect a bunch of angel investors and community members to come listen to our final pitch. 
And so we pitched our business, um, the audience asked questions, and then we have a demo table. So it was, you know, it was exciting to see that when we started the program, we had an MVP that was not something that we were ready to hit the market with. And then on this demo day a few days ago, we had a fully functioning product, a web dashboard, a mobile app, a polished pitch. And it's like the progress was incredible. And we are so thankful once again to have to have that to have had that experience. And I highly recommend for startups that are starting off to go through some sort of accelerator or incubator because if you're trying to raise money or you're trying to get um, venture capital, the bars are raising. And for example, an angel investor 10 years ago might have invested in, a, in an idea on a napkin. And now angel investors want to see revenue and traction. So we were just discussing this. It's like, how do startups fill that gap from having an idea and then launching and having revenue? It's like, who's going to help you fund that? And these accelerators are the answer. They're, they're filling that gap between idea and revenue to help accelerate the business. They take that risk on the early stage startups. So where might someone start, wherever they are in the country or other places in the world, where do you recommend they go to look for these resources? So there's, there are accelerators all over the United States. There are um, also online, there's online access to some accelerators. So Y Combinator is probably one of the most popular. Um, that's up in San Francisco. I think they do have an online program as well, but I would just research wherever you are, um, startup accelerator, startup incubator, Get into your startup community because once you find someone that's in it, they'll help you get around. And that's what's great about startup communities that everyone's collaborative and wants to help each other. So I would recommend, yeah, searching up your city and looking at accelerators in, in your area. You can also check out f6s.com. Um, they would give you access and a lot of the applications go through there. So that's a great resource um, and place to start. Fantastic. Thanks for providing all that valuable information. Now, you live in one of the greatest cities in the world, Los Angeles. What is startup life like living in LA? It's, in my opinion, it's one of the best places to start a company because, like I said before, it's so collaborative. And from comparing it to cities like New York or San Francisco, where, you know, it's more cutthroat here, everybody wants to help each other. So we've built this community of people, mentors, resources, accelerators, working spaces that opens the door for anyone. And if you aren't ready for an accelerator, maybe you're a little bit earlier stage, we have incubators, we have mentors, we have people that just want to help and give back. And that's what makes LA unique in its startup culture. And that's why it was a great place for us to start as students with no, no almost relatively no experience in the industries that we were trying to start a business in. Um, we had access to mentors that were willing and excited to help. That's awesome. And I love LA. It's just, it seems to, I've been out there a couple of times now to interview some people and you're right. It just seems like people are really willing to help. But um, part of that is you have to be willing to put yourself out there, right? You have to take that first step. You can't expect people to be uh, reaching out to you. Right. Yeah. It's all about building your network and networking strategically. Excellent. Okay, you mentioned the pitch earlier. Can we shift into pitching life, as you call it, uh, the pitch deck, uh, these different competitions and conferences? Is that different than what you were talking about earlier? Um, it's a, I mean, there, that's a whole other life, and we can definitely go into that. So pitch deck is basically, if we had to simplify it in the, in the easiest way possible, 10 slides, um, you can look it up, like the 10 most important slides for a pitch deck, you know, talk about the problem, talk about your solution, talk about the market, talk about the financials, all that, all that type of stuff. Um, but what I, when I say pitch life, you know, you could get into this, this kind of cycle of pitching where you are applying to as many competitions as you can, pitching at conferences, and they're all a little bit different, but we actually did that when we were in, in college because there are a lot of opportunities for students to pitch their business and win money. And that's how we funded our first company. We pitched at competitions and won money. And it was almost like a sport. We would joke around, we would joke about it and say, like, we play a sport. It's called pitching your business at competitions. And, <laughs> you know, if you do it enough times, you get really good and you learn about what they're looking for. You read the judging criteria, you find out who's judging, and then you tailor your pitch to them. So that was a fun stage. We, would, we were flying around the U.S. pitching at different um, events and schools. 
and, you know, and winning real money. And, and that money is essentially free money because you don't have to pay it back. You're, you win it and they give it to you and it's great. So it's a great resource, especially for students, but there are competitions out there for the general public. Um, my only advice would be don't get too caught up in that world because if you get caught up in this pitch world where you're changing your pitch, you know, applying to competitions, then you're not focusing on your business. So it's about finding that balance. And in the beginning, it's great because, you know, you're still trying to validate your idea. You need free money. But then as you get farther along, it's more of a distraction. So that's that's my advice is, is just assess where you're at. And if the applications are taking too much time away from your business, then maybe you should just really consider, is this important? And it, do I really want to apply to this one? Great point. Great point. Fantastic. Well, wow. Thank you for your time today. What is next for you? We know you have this big launch coming up. Um, beyond that, if you were to, I don't typically ask this question, but I'd love to just know, if you were to think out 10 years from now, where do you see yourself? I mean, that's a hard question because things change so fast in my world. I, um, I just, I, 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 selfishly, I can't wait to see where you are in 10 years from now, but I'm just curious what you're thinking about. Um, I definitely see this business taking off and growing and in the industry that we're in, it's likely that we'll be acquired as we grow. Um, there's I'm a talking about the agency. I'm sorry, the agency, yeah, or the startup, the healthcare startup okay. um, in the healthcare industry our startups like ours usually get acquired quickly because either a healthcare organizations such as a hospital wants to innovate like, like we're doing and they just will acquire the technology or will reach such a wide um, a wide audience that the insurance companies will get interested and then they'll want to kind of merge or partner. So I'm seeing an acquisition occurring within the next 10 years for that business. And I see my agency growing and um, hopefully, you know, becoming a really large company by that time. And I'll probably have another venture going also. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, quick question on podcasting. What are your thoughts uh, being in the marketing digital agency world? What are your thoughts about podcasting in, in general and uh, how it could benefit anyone's business? Yeah, so I mean, I'm guilty of not having one as of now, but I think that they're a great way to get out information, um, give free resources to your listeners, and get more exposure. And they're relatively free to start. You know, you just need a microphone and a webcam and a and, computer that works. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we all have that anyway. So I think it's a great resource. Um, the only part that I would wonder is how do you grow your podcast in an effective way? And then does that take time and resources away from your real business? So I would want to learn more about that before I would give my opinion. But in general, I think podcasts are incredible. Um, it's great that you can listen to them while you're driving, you know, at any point in the day. And I would recommend that businesses do them and definitely something that we've considered and that we want to start soon. And as you talked about earlier, the side hustle could be a very nice side hustle for people in any business, right? No matter what business you're in, if you're trying to find your voice or differentiate yourself from your competitors or anyone else in the space, it's a nice way to do that on your own time. Absolutely. Fantastic. Alexis, wow, you gave us a lot of great information today. How do people reach you if they're interested, if, they're, if, if they would like to reach out to you for agency work? What's the best way to contact you? So for the agency, it's just uh, the website, simply-branded.com. Um, you can also reach me at my direct email, which is alexis at simply-branded.com. And then if you're interested in learning more about the startup, if you're an orthopedic clinic, if, you wanna, if you're interested in investing, um, the website is called xphealth.com. It's expyhealth.com. So each of those two places. Um, and then on a personal level, you can go to my personal website, which is just alexisshomer.com as well. Excellent. We'll put all the links in there. You are also a speaker. So if people want to reach out to you for speaking, is the best way through your email as well? Yeah. And, and anyway, any of my businesses, you can contact me and I'll, I'll be available. Um, and that reminds me, in the next 10 years, I definitely see myself becoming more of a, a, a speaker and giving back and just sharing my story and inspiring people. So I would, I would love to have more opportunities like that. And um, it's once again about the balance between 
how many, how much time can I give speaking versus running a business, but speaking something I love to do and see myself doing more in the next few years. Wonderful. Alexis Schomer, welcome to the American Real Family. Thanks so much for sharing your story with us today. I would love to have you back uh, again sometime so we could keep up on all your progress. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.